Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Getz. I am the Community Services Librarian at the San Bruno Public Library. On behalf of the library and all of our speakers this evening, I'd like to welcome you to Remembering Tanfran. Remembering Tanfran is part of a series of programs called Confronting History, Stories of Internment, which is co-sponsored by the San Bruno Public Library, the Redwood City Public Library, and the South San Francisco Public Library. We have two more programs in the series that I'd like to mention tonight before we get to um, our panel this evening. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have Saturday, February 26th at 2022 at 1 p.m. author Kiku Hughes will be discussing her graphic novel, Displacement, which tells the story of a young American named Kiku who is suddenly transported to a Japanese American internment camp during World War II alongside her grandmother. And interestingly, a portion of the book does take place at the Tanfran Assembly Center. And then later on March 2nd, 2022 at 7 p.m., authors Kevin Katz and Linda Ivey will virtually discuss their nonfiction book, Citizen Internees, a second look at race and citizenship in Japanese American internment camps. Examining a banker's wartime correspondence, which is archived at the Redwood City Public Library's local history room, this book provides a rich glimpse into the lives of Japanese and Japanese American internees from Redwood City. Registration links for these programs, as well as suggested reading and watching lists and other online resources can be found at our website, stories.sanbrunolibrary.org. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Leslie Hadamiya a third generation Japanese American whose parents were interned during World War II, including her mother at Tanfran. Leslie is the author of Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans and the Passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. She's the executive director of the San Bruno Community Foundation. Leslie will introduce our other speakers, Steve Okamoto and Ben Takeshita and each of whom is uniquely connected, uniquely connected to the Tanfran Assembly Center. Unfortunately, our fourth speaker for this evening, Harry Kawahara, was injured on Monday and is unable to join us this evening. But we will forge ahead and have a lot of interesting information to learn and hear about. Um, we'll begin with an overview presentation from Leslie to provide a historical background on the wartime internment and then we'll bring in our panelists to talk about their experiences. And lastly, we'll discuss the new memorial installation that recently broke ground at the Tamfram Art Station. So here you go, Leslie. Thank you, Susan. I am so pleased to be here with all of you tonight uh, to talk about a very important part of San Bruno's and my own family's history. It's a story too few know about, even those who were born and raised in San Bruno. I'm going to begin with an overview of the history of the internment and what led the US to it. I think providing this context is important for those of you who are new to the Tanfran story. This is how we know Tanfran today. It was built as a shopping mall in 1971 and was renovated and reopened in its current format in 2005. We've just learned it will soon go through another remake in the coming years as a mixed use retail, housing and biotech or tech campus. But 80 years ago, during World War II, Tan France served a much different purpose. 80 years ago, it was where the US government incarcerated approximately 8,000 people of Japanese ancestry as part of one of the most shameful episodes in American history. The government rounded up a total of 120,000 Japanese Americans, uprooted them from their homes and communities, and forced them into internment camps without due process of law, solely in the name of military necessity. 80 years ago, my mother was seven years old when she was evacuated from San Leandro, California, with her parents and siblings, and was sent to Tanfran and then eventually to the Topaz camp in Utah. Let's go back to December 7th, 1941. Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, the United States declares war on Japan. Prejudice against people of Asian ancestry has an extensive history in, in America. And when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans' worst fears were realized. They were Americans by heart, but looked like the enemy. While well, American-born Nisei, or second-generation Japanese Americans, were US citizens, 
first-generation Issei suddenly became enemy aliens. Knowing that a Japanese attack was imminent, the FBI was prepared. Within hours of the bombing, it had arrested nearly 1,300 alien Japanese American community leaders. These included Japanese newspaper editors and publishers, Buddhist and Christian ministers, community leaders, business people, and Japanese language teachers. They were arrested and sent to detention centers because the FBI considered them suspicious. The weeks following the attack on Pearl Harbor were very difficult for the Japanese Americans. There was pressure for harsher measures against them. And by the end of December, 1941, all enemy aliens in California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Nevada were ordered to surrender all contraband, including radios, binoculars, cameras, and some weapons. By February, 1942, a curfew between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. and a five-mile travel limit were placed on alien Japanese Americans. False stories of spies and Japanese activists were published. Racist attitudes quickly spread up and down the West Coast. Many groups like the American Legion and the Native Sons of the Golden West called for the evacuation and incarceration of all Japanese Americans. The entire California congressional delegation advised President Roosevelt to remove the West Coast Japanese American population. And to make matters worse, many liberal groups that were usually committed to civil rights did not defend the Japanese Americans. Only some Quaker groups did. Oregon and Washington supported California's call for the Japanese American evacuation and internment. The rest of the country paid little or no attention, so there was no opposition to this pressure. And President Roosevelt finally caved, and on February 19, 1942, he signed Executive Order 9066, which set the stage for the Japanese American internment. It gave the Secretary of War the authority to designate military areas from which any and all persons may be excluded. Although it did not explicitly name Japanese Americans, everyone knew what it was about. And this was despite strong opposition from the Attorney General, who said it was unconstitutional, and the FBI director, who said it was not justified on military and national security grounds. Executive Order 9066 set off a rapid series of executive, military, and congressional events, which ultimately led to the exclusion and incarceration of West Coast Japanese Americans. Under the leadership of the Japanese American Citizens League, a community group, Japanese Americans for the most part decided to voluntarily and peacefully comply with the orders. The reason they did so was to prove their loyalty and because they believed that they would be treated better if they cooperated. Beginning in March, 1942, a series of civilian exclusion orders and public proclamations were issued that extended travel restrictions, curfew and contraband regulations to all Japanese Americans, regardless of citizenship and eventually called for all persons of Japanese ancestry in California and parts of Washington, Oregon, and Arizona to turn themselves in at temporary detention centers. The evacuation took a total of eight months from March to November, 1942. 17 temporary detention or assembly centers were set up in the three coastal states in Arizona. These were mainly converted fairgrounds, racetracks, and livestock exhibition halls. And they were needed to give the government time to build the permanent camps. One of these detention centers was located at, in San Bruno at the location which is now the shops at San Fran. The Japanese Americans were eventually moved to 10 permanent internment camps that were spread out across the country, two as far east as Arkansas. They were located primarily in desolate, isolated areas, as you can see on the map. As you may know, from 1899 to 1964, Tanfran was a thoroughbred horse racing facility. Over the years, Tanfran saw a number of famous horses compete on its track, including champion thoroughbred sea biscuits. During World War II, the racetrack was quickly transformed into a detention center, housing 8,000 Japanese Americans from April to November, 1942. Here are images of Japanese Americans heading off to camp. They were usually only given maybe a few days to a week's notice of the evacuation and were allowed only to take those belongings that they could carry. 
Property had to be sold quickly for pennies on the dollar or abandoned. Many left behind family photos and other sentimental items, not knowing if they would ever get them back. At Tanfran, Japanese Americans were housed in horse stalls that reeked of manure. Barracks were also hastily built on the inside of the racetrack. The internees slept on mattresses filled with hay. The internees had to eat in mess halls, having, having to wait in long lines to get their food. Much of the food was like army rations and very different from the Japanese food they were accustomed to eating. The Japanese Americans did their best to create communities in the camp. Schools were set up, which children attended. Kids played childhood games like marbles, just like children outside the camp. Sports leagues were set up and they organized community activities like dances where young people were able to socialize. The official government explanation was that the mass incarceration was required by military necessity. But remember that those considered suspicious were detained immediately. Kids, seniors, and the disabled, who could hardly be considered threats, were incarcerated. While the US was also at war with Italy and Germany, the 690,000 Italians and 314,000 Germans in the US were not interned. Neither were the 160,000 Japanese in Hawaii. People of German and Italian descent on the mainland and the Japanese in Hawaii were primarily arrested and detained on an individual basis if the government felt there was a reason to be suspicious of them. Notably, there were no incidents of espionage or sabotage known to have been committed by Japanese Americans during World War II. On the question of loyalty, it's important to mention that the loyalty questionnaire the Japanese Americans were asked to complete. In 1943, the government created a bureaucratic means of assessing the loyalty of all adults in the camp. First, to prepare to extend the draft of the adult male population in camp, and second, to release loyal Japanese Americans from the camps for relocation to the non-restricted interior states. The final two questions on the form created confusion and resentment, and those two questions are on the screen in front of you. The Nisei, who were US citizens, resented being asked to renounce their loyalty to the Emperor of Japan when they had never been loyal to him to start with. The Issei were Japanese immigrants who were barred from becoming US citizens on the base, basis of racial exclusion. And for many of them, renouncing their only citizenship was problematic. Young men worried that declaring their willingness to serve in combat units of the army would be akin to volunteering. About 20,000 individuals used this questionnaire as an opportunity to express their individual frustrations and anger with the government for the entire program of mass removal and incarceration. They refused to answer the questions, qualify their answers, or answer no to one or both of the loyalty questions. Some also requested repatriation or expatriation to Japan, and the government started segregating those that had labeled the loyal from the disloyal. The government moved the no-nos, as they were called, to the Thule Lake Camp, which was turned into a segregation facility. It took decades for the U.S. to finally question whether the internment was justified. In 1980, Congress passed legislation creating the Commission on the Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. Its charge was to investigate the government's wartime actions with regard to the Japanese American internment and report on its findings. From July to December, 1981, the government held 20 days of hearings in nine cities. Over 750 witnesses testified, including former internees, government officials, academics, and community leaders. The commission staff also did extensive primary research, collecting documents from government and university archives and reviewing historical texts. In December 1982, the commission released its 467 page report entitled Personal Justice Denied. Findings were submitted to Congress in 1983. The report gave an account of Japanese American history, the process involving the military's decision to evacuate and intern the West Coast Japanese Americans and a description of the evacuation and internment. It concluded that quote, 
Executive Order 9066 was not justified by military necessity and the decisions which followed from it, detention, ending detention and ending exclusion were not driven by analysis of military conditions. The broad historical causes which shaped these decisions were race prejudice, war hysteria and a failure of political leadership. A grave injustice was done to Japanese American citizens and resident aliens of Japanese ancestry who, without individual review or any probative evidence against them, were excluded, removed, and detained by the United States during World War II. In June 1983, the commission issued five recommendations for remedies as an act of national apology. The commission's report and recommendations laid the groundwork for the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which after a long fight, Congress passed and President Ronald Reagan signed into law. The bill provided a national apology, which you can see in the note on the screen, provided payments of $20,000 in monetary compensation to each surviving internee and set up a public education trust fund. In the end, about 80,000 surviving internees and evacuees received its compensation. The total price tag for the legislation was $1.25 billion. This was an extremely historic piece of legislation. As more than 40 years after the war, the US government was finally admitting that it was wrong and that it was doing something to right that wrong. There are many lessons to learn from this story. When the redress legislation was funded in 1989, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, one of the key leaders in Congress in the fight for redress said, quote, we are now at the end of a long and most painful process. It has been said that the wheels of justice grind slowly. It may seem intolerably slowly to the victims of injustice. However, I hope it restores a measure of faith in our nation's system of government to see it do its best to redress a wrong that has been committed. While we individually and as a nation must put the pain and bitter memories behind us, we must not forget them. Rather, this chapter must remain in our collective conscience as a great reminder of what we are capable of in a time of crisis and what we must not allow to happen again to any group, regardless of race, religion, or national origin. So that we don't forget this shameful part of American history, we have brought to you two individuals who were incarcerated in Tan Fran in 1942, Ben Takeshita and Steve Okamoto, so that you can hear directly from them what the wartime internment was like. My uncle, Harry Kawahara, was also supposed to join us, but a leg injury early this week prevented his participation, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Take off the screen share, and we're going to bring in our two other panelists. Our first panelist is Ben Takeshita, and Ben, we need you to turn on your screen. Ben was an 11 year old living in San Mateo when he, his parents and his seven siblings were sent to Tan Fran in 1942. Ben's family was also sent to Topaz later that year. When all internees 17 and older had to take the loyalty questionnaire in 1943, Ben's parents and older siblings answered no, no, believing that the internment to be unconstitutional and Ben and his family was then moved from Topaz to Tule Lake. Thinking they might be sent to Japan, Ben's brother made him attend Japanese language classes at Tule Lake. And when the war ended, Ben and his family returned to San Mateo. Viewed as a no-no family, uh, Ben enlisted in the US Army for three years to prove his loyalty to the US. With his Japanese language skills and additional training at the Army Language School in Monterey, Ben was assigned to the Military Intelligence Unit and sent to Japan and Korea during the Korean War. He married his wife, Fumiko, attended the College of San Mateo, graduated from UC Berkeley under the GI Bill, and spent a 43-year career at the California Department of Employment. Now at age 91, which is amazing, Ben lives in Richmond across the Bay. He is a member of the Tan Fran Assembly Center Memorial Committee. And our second panelist is Steve Okamoto. Steve was born on March 25, 1942. And just five weeks later, 
Steve and his parents, sister and grandparents left their home in San Francisco for San Fran. Steve's father was bilingual and was selected to teach Japanese to a U.S. Naval Intelligence officers at a school in Colorado. So when the family left Tan Fran in August 1942, they did not go to one of the permanent internment camps and instead relocated in Boulder, Colorado. After the war, Steve and his family moved back to San Francisco. A Cal graduate, Steve's career spanned 50 years in the finance industry and, 30, and 10 years in fundraising for the American Cancer Society. Steve and his wife, Diana, have made their home in Foster City, where Steve was elected to the city council in 2011 and served one term. Steve is vice president of the Tan Fran Assembly Center Memorial Committee. Welcome to you both, Ben and Steve. So both of you were children during the internment and Steve, you were just an infant. Yet I know that both of you have memories from the time as well as reflections on how the wartime experience affected your lives. So now let's explore some of those thoughts and memories. So the evacuation orders were handed down in the spring of 1942, and you were only given one or two weeks notice to pack, and you could only bring what you could carry. So Ben, let's talk to you first. Can you tell us what you and your family packed and what you as a child were able to bring? It sounds like your mother was particularly organized in packing the family's belongings. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, do my best to remember a lot of those things. But at 11 years old, I was um, naturally a kid, and to me, it was very ex exciting. So uh, we were going to go to this bus to go to a place called Tamfran. So anyway, um, my mother, uh, you know, we could only take what we can carry. So my mother made sure that we wore a lot of sweaters and jackets and enough clothing on, on us so that we can take as many things as we can. And then um, because Hawaii was uh, bombed and that was a sugar, uh, you know, um, they were making sugar to pass on to the mainland and so on. And so sugar was very expensive. So my mother, I know, made sugar brittles, not peanut brittle because peanuts were expensive. So she made uh, just sugar brittles because we didn't know what our food situation was going to be. And with, therefore, with the sugar brittles, we could nibble on them when we got hungry, not knowing what we would be getting. And then my mother uh, also uh, made uh, canvas bags or, or spreads of bread, uh, bed spreads and so on, and put uh, in them the pillows, the blankets and so on. And those of us who were old enough to carry it, then when we were given uh, these bags of things to carry, we had carried uh, my pill the pillows and blankets and so on, uh, and also the eating utensils, uh, usually made out of metal and not um, ceramic, so that um, we could have those for for our food. And we, these were things that were told we were told to bring anyway, but. We could only take what we could carry, so we didn't have any suitcases or anything as far as our family. So and our family of 10 at that time, so we had a nice uh, four-door Nash, American Motors Nash, and um, we left that in the garage. Um, my parents um, were the, my father was the only one that was working because the rest of us were still going to school. So um, uh, we had this, uh, uh, he had his uh, pickup truck because he was a landscape gardener. And uh, we just left that on the street because uh, uh, we couldn't take that with us. I, I had a bicycle, we had to leave that. And the only thing that I could sneak uh, as a toy was a bag of marble, marbles because I had some good marbles. And uh, that was the only thing I could sneak into my uh, fence pocket uh, as a toy, I had a lot of baseball mitten, mittens and bats and uh, gloves and um, uh, a lot of uh, toys, but I had to leave all that uh, uh, when we had to leave. And our, and our team, uh, they came up on May the 19th. I remember that day is when we had to leave our home and walk to this place to catch our buses. 
and we, as we walked <laughs> by with these bags of uh, things that we had, and I was carrying up a bag of something, I don't know what was in there, but I remember passing um, my schoolmates that we used to go to great school with, and uh, they were peeking from their curtains, for house big curtains as we walked by, and uh, they didn't come out to wish us well. So I was wondering, I was very disappointed and feeling very badly about uh, my friends, uh, schoolmates not coming out. But many years later, I realized that they were Germans and Italians and uh, they really didn't know what was gonna happen to them after we left. So uh, I could understand that they were uh, hesitant to be friendly with us. We were called enemy aliens and therefore, um, um, they didn't want to take a chance of not knowing what was going to happen to them. So many years later, I realized that uh, what the situation was and kind of forgave them for um, um, not coming out to wish as well. When we got to the place where the bus was uh, to be loaded, uh, there were a lot of Caucasian men and women helping out and they were very helpful in helping us to assign us to, to the buses and also uh, gave us refreshments and so on. And many years later, I found out that these were Quakers who were opposed to uh, this um, putting us into camp and so on. So uh, uh, I mentioned this every time because uh, the Japanese Americans were very uh, appreciative of what they did because I'm sure after we left, um, because we, they were so friendly with the so-called enemy aliens that uh, they were um, uh, very hesitant to, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that they were harassed and so on after we left. But uh, we, so we thanked them for doing, sticking their neck out, so to speak, to help us out. Uh, when we got to Tam Fran, uh, we were told to get to the, go to the grandstand and uh, there um, we were told where we we're gonna live and, and, and about the mess halls and so on. So uh, that was the uh, initial start of this life of uh, not knowing when and if we're gonna ever come, be able to come back to Simondale. But this is the uh, place where we're, we're gonna be starting this new venture. So, so as an 11 year old, I was uh, kind of excited uh, not knowing what was gonna happen and uh, uh, not to, having a chance of taking a bus or anything. So it was, um, uh, for me, very exciting uh, to see all the, or experience all these new things that were happening to us as we uh, walked and got on the bus to go to a place called Tamfran in San Bruno, which took about an hour from San Mateo. Okay, thanks, Ben. That is a great introduction to the, the wartime experience. Steve, can you briefly tell us about how your family dealt with the evacuation orders and, and getting to San Fran? Certainly. We um, noticed there were two dates on these uh, signs that were plastered all over telephone posts and whatnot. The first one was to report to get a name tag because these name tags were supposed to go on our lapels, our suitcases and whatnot. And uh, one of the things that my dad realized is after he got it, there were no names on there, just a number. And he was told, yeah, you're, you don't have a name anymore. You were now, in our case, 10953. That was our family number. The second date was to report back to the same place and be picked up by a bus. Um, my mom, like most moms, were very organized. Uh, we, we carried sheets and towels, mostly. Um, my sister was three years old, so she only carried her little uh, dolls you know, and whatnot. I was a baby, five weeks old, so my mom had to carry me in a diaper bag. So my dad was, uh, was left with carrying two heavy suitcases. Uh, we lived about seven blocks away from where we were to meet down Bush Street in San Francisco. So we had to walk all that way. We finally got on the bus. We were able to, because my dad was a very astute businessman, we were able to um, 
work with a local bank. I don't remember the name of it, but um, they were in charge of renting out our, our pair of flats in San Francisco. And so we didn't have to worry too much about it. We knew that the bank was going to take care of it. So we walked to the uh, pickup place. We got on a bus. Uh, they required the shades to be drawn. So we had no idea where we were going, how long it would take. Uh, but it took uh, maybe uh, about an hour. And when we finally got to our destination, we got out of the bus, looked around, and we've never been here. It was the infield of Tanfran Racetrack. Thank you. So now you've arrived at Tanfran and you've got just the belongings you can carry and you don't know what's ahead of you. Um, so let's talk about life inside of Tanfran. So both of you, when you look back, what, what's your most vivid memory of Tanfran? So Ben, let's start with you. What's your most single most vivid memory of Tanfran? Well, there was no school for us. You know, naturally school is very important in our, in our lives, but there were no schools. I found out later that they, were, they, were, they did have schools, but we weren't taught about it. So we, uh, I, we would make friends. We, I, I was 11 years old, so we would make friends with the new people and so on. And, and um, when they rang the bell for the mess hall for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we, we would go with our friends and uh, go go have uh, get in line and uh, uh, eat with them instead of in the family. When we were in our families before uh, we went into camp, our family would be uh, sitting at dinner time on a big table and we would talk about what happened during the day and and had really had a good time in these family gatherings well, at least uh, at dinner time. But in Camp Fran. It was a start, I think, of a breakout of family uh, living because we, we would go with our friends and uh, my mother, she wasn't that sociable. And so she would uh, go by herself to uh, get the meal and go back to the uh, barrack. We were fortunate because of our large family of 10, we were fortunate in, in getting two big rooms in the barracks. So um, uh, she would go back to the barracks and eat by herself or my father was uh, working at the mess hall or something so um, uh, to get some money uh, for the work uh, I think it was $16 a month for uh, cigarettes or whatever you toothpaste and so on and need, need it. that was the only income that we had so um, the food wasn't bad it was more stews and that kind of thing that they would serve in um um, armies and so on, but uh, um, a lot of times for lunch, you would have these uh, uh, lunch meats like salami or bolognese and so on. And a lot of the older people, uh, they would get tired of the, this lunch meal that uh, they were having. But I uh, was young and I, I was hungry all the time, so I would go around to the tables and uh, uh, if I asked the, the older people if they wanted their bologna or salamis, and uh, if they didn't want it, I said, well, give it to me. And I uh, went around to the tables and uh, had these bolognese and salamis. And I still, to this day, still like them, that kind of food. But uh, I, I, lived, I ate well uh, in camp because of the way I uh, was able to uh, get the food from the adults that they didn't want. And uh, so I had a, a good time as far as I was concerned. As an 11 year old, didn't have to go to school and we just played around all day and ate. And, and then at nighttime, we would come and go back to the rooms and s sleep so that we can play again the next day. So that was a, to me, it was a good life. Uh, naturally, we were restricted. We, couldn't go out uh, and there were no running waters in the rooms and so on. Only one light bulb. So we had to use a lot of extension cords and also to provide some privacy. My mother would uh, hang, uh, get ropes and hang uh, clothing or uh, mattresses or not mattresses, bedspreads or um, around to 
provide some privacy in the rooms that uh, we were allowed. So uh, that was the way we, we had to um, uh, survive. And uh, we have to, every time we had to take care of ourselves, we had to go to the latrines, which were not, uh, there were no running waters in the um, barracks room. So we had to just uh, walk these latrines and, and go and do our business or um, showers. We have to use the showers, but there were no partitions or anything to keep these um, things private. So um, I, I know my sis, two sisters, older sisters, they really had a rough time getting uh, used to this because naturally when you were at home, you had that privacy. And then you come, come the next day, we get into this temporary um, room or two large rooms, no privacy, no um, um, partitions for the toilets or the showers. And so they really had a rough time trying to... Uh, get used to that kind of lack of privacy. And uh, with the men, men, men and boys, I, I figured, oh, well, we just um, did the best we can and that was it. So I didn't uh, feel, uh, don't remember any bad feelings about that either. I was more for um, having fun with my friends and eating a lot of bolognese and salamis, and enjoying uh, whatever we can. Because I think uh, we just realized very quickly that uh, um, we were, we had no weapons, we had no way of being violent or um, opposing uh, what was happening to us. So we just tried to make the best of our, our lives. And uh, that, that was the attitude because no use, no use being mad, mad about it because uh, we couldn't do anything anyway. So that was the attitude that I had anyway. Uh, I just enjoyed my um, life in Camp Ryan, although I should say this. But because uh, naturally the adults were very well confined to and really uh, couldn't do the things that they wanted to do and so on. They, they really uh, didn't like this kind of atmosphere, this kind of uh, situation that we were being uh, thrown into. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That is a great description of life inside the camp. Um, how about you, Steve? So what is your most vivid memory of Tan Fran? I remember, Leslie, I was only five weeks old. <laughs> oh, so, um, you know, I, I really don't want to say what my most vivid is because it's a little personal, but, you know, you, know, you mentioned that there were 8,000 people there, 8,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, uh, men, women, children, old people, the invalid, orphans. It didn't matter if you were one sixteenth Japanese blood, you were rounded up and thrown into Tan Faran. But because there were so many people and they did not build enough barracks, many of us had to live in another housing accommodation. And what else is there at a racetrack, but a horse stall. So about half of us actually had to live in a horse stall. Um, I can tell you a little bit about it, but the most vivid memory I have afterwards, as I got older and learned what was really happening, was my mom. She said, you know, Steve, I don't really remember too much about life in Tan Faran, but the thing that I would never forget for the rest of my life was the smell of the urine and the manure. And many, many people share that same terrible experience. So tell us a little bit more about the, the horse stalls and the conditions in the horse stalls. I mean, you talked about the, the smell, but just, you know, how big were they? Did they keep people warm? You know, like, did anybody have privacy? Give us a, give us a sense of what the horse stalls were like. Well, the horse stalls were nine feet wide and 20 feet deep. And there were actually two rooms the front room, they had two little windows and they were uh, eight feet wide and, or excuse me, uh, nine feet wide and eight feet deep. So that's where we, you know, did our living. Uh, the back room was um, nine feet uh, by 20 feet. So we had, oh, uh, no, excuse me, nine by 12, I'm sorry. And that's where we slept. But 
because the walls didn't go all the way up to the roof, there was space between each compartment. So as it was, as it was in the barracks, there was no privacy from the sound. We couldn't hear everything that was going on next to us. And um, my mom said that we had to whisper. We couldn't make a lot of noise. And, um, you know, when I do give these presentations, I, I wonder how it was uh, that 163 kids were born in Tan Fran if there was much privacy. But there was no running water, as Ben suggests. We had one light. Uh, we didn't have much warmth because the, obviously the horse stalls were not insulated. So we had to kind of wrap ourselves in blankets and um, it, it, was, it was just a, a terrible condition. Uh, I am so fortunate that I do not remember it. I did not experience it so that I, I could not really tell you how terrible it was, but only from what I've heard and, when, and from what I've read. Thank if you. I could add to that, sure. my cousins were a family of four, so they were unfortunate in being put into horse stalls, as, as Steve says. And I remember uh, when I went there to visit them and so on, how they could stand living in that place. And in fact, my nose gets kind of remembering what it was like because there was a stench of the urine and the manure. And then the flooring had a lot of space in between. So you have to be careful that you didn't drop anything because the coin or something or pen or something, if you drop it, many times the flooring was so split wide that they would fall through the flooring. So that they had uh, uh, to be very careful. But uh, at nighttime, they had to turn and shut their doors. And my goodness, I, when I was in there, I, I, I remember uh, the stench of being in, in that kind of a uh, room. And, and we were fortunate that we were in these uh, barracks. Uh, then the barracks were not um, uh, um, private uh, oriented either in that uh, the walls were made out of thin plywood and there were no ceilings. So we could hear people talking on the both ends of a barrack. And we had the two rooms in, the, in, in, in between. There were two um, small rooms on the ends of the barracks and then about three larger rooms uh, in between. And, but um, because of the um, flimsy wall and there were no ceilings, we, we could hear people talking on both ends of the um, barracks. So we had to be quiet and whisper whenever we were at home, uh, in our room, so to speak. So I remember that part um, very well. Thank you. So Steve, Steve you were an infant. How, how did your parents cope with caring for an infant, a newborn, basically, um, under those conditions? What was that life okay. for them? You know, it, it's tough raising a child in any conditions, but to have to you know, raise me in uh, that terrible condition. Um, I also was uh, drinking formula out of a bottle, but since we had no running water, since we had no heating, my dad would have to uh, get a bottle, uh, run across the track to the, uh, the uh, they called it commissary, uh, other people call it mess hall, uh, to warm up my bottle. And my mom told me one story about when it was cold and raining, my dad would have to bundle up, run across the track, warm up my bottle, mm -hmm. bundle up and come back and give me my bottle. But of course, by that time, the bottle was cold. So it was very difficult yeah, to I raise can imagine. me. I can imagine. And, and Ben, you know, you were in a family of 10. Tell, tell us a little bit about, you You were, I guess, fortunate to be in the barracks and not in one of the horse stalls, but how did a family of 10 basically live in probably one room? Describe that for us. Yeah, I don't know where my mother had got some ropes, but she would put ropes uh, from one, one part to another to kind of give them some semblance, semblance of a room to provide 
privacy for my parents and my sisters, and then us men, boys. Um, and then we had two rooms, so my older, two older brothers and uh, uh, and us were in one one room, the men's room, and then my parents and the mother, uh, sisters were in the other. So um, uh, we, we the walls were very thin, and we could hear our people talking on the other other sides of the barracks and so on. But uh, we we just learned to live with that because nothing we could do was this is our place we had to live in, and. Um, so um, we, we tried to adjust as much as we can. Uh, you know, the, later on, we uh, were reading about the federal government, how they were saying that uh, they made these uh, barracks and so on and um, for our safety. And yet we realized that uh, our, these Tam Fran racetracks and all the camps that we were in had barbed wire fences around the, the camp itself and, and with the barbed wire facing inwards to keep us in and not outwards to keep people from, from coming in and so on. And the guard towers that were strategically located would be having military police in there with rifles and some with machine guns facing inwards to keep us in and uh, not to protect us for, for, from people coming in uh, they were certainly in the searchlights at nighttime were sh shining inside to make sure that we weren't going to escape or do something uh, during the nighttime or something. So it was a ridiculous kind of a situation. But again, as I said, uh, human beings are such that we just uh, find out what the circumstances are and we try to live the best way we can uh, and uh, take take it at that. You, you described it as a child, um, you know, it was kind of an adventure, right? It was new and you had freedoms that you didn't have at home. So it had, there was fun elements to it. But it, as an 11 year old, did you really understand why you were there and why the government had put you in these camps? And, you know, what did you think of that as a kid and seeing the, you know, the, the guards and the barbed wire faced in? You know, uh, as I said, when we were not in the camps, before we went into camps, our family at nighttime, especially we talked a lot at the dinner table and so on, but we didn't do any of that because we went separately uh, individually. So we lost the family reunion uh, kind, mm -hmm. kind of atmosphere. So uh, uh, we didn't really, uh, and when, they, when we were notified about having to leave our home and go into these so-called camps, uh, they didn't talk much about that at the dinner tables when we were, you know, um, I think, uh, come to think of it, that they tried to protect us kids for not worrying or not being afraid of what was gonna be happening because I don't remember any kind of talk about the executive order, executive order 9066 or anything like that as to what mm -hmm. was going to happen to us uh, and where we were going and so on. I don't remember any of those kinds of uh, conversations. So I, I have a feeling I learned later on that uh, they probably uh, kept those kinds of uh, uh, conversations, uh, uh, not when we were, we kids were around and uh, protected us from those kinds of uh, news or uh, conversations. Right, you were you were shielded, shielded basically right. from from the reality of what you were going through. So let's shift a little bit from life inside the camp to the lessons we can learn from internment and how the episode affected your lives. So Steve, Steve, how how did you know you were a baby, but you did have that experience and um, had to live with it afterwards. So how did internment infect your life? And when did you really realize what your family had gone through? Uh, there were three significant um, things that happened afterwards. Uh, the first in the 70s, um, I was with the San Francisco chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League. And uh, one of our board members was a school teacher. And uh, she said, you know, there are no history books 
that talk about what happened to the Japanese. So that was one of my, um, you know, campaigns was to get mention of the Japanese experience in all of the California high school history books. The second thing was uh, when we were fighting for redress, I was very involved with that. And, um, you know, you told that story, so I won't go over it. But I think the thing that was the really the most important for me was as I learned about what happened and talking to my friends and and uh, their kids, because I did speak about this in some of the high schools, is that the young people had no idea what happened to their parents, to their grandparents, to their uncles, aunts. And so I, at that time, realized that I've got to get the message out. I've got to talk. I've got to make presentations. And so, you know, in the last five years, you know, I, I go all over the Bay Area. I speak to high schools, speak to middle school, Rotary clubs, Lions clubs, churches to get the word out. And then I found out that even not only the Japanese kids didn't know about it, but the Caucasian, the non-Japanese, they had no idea what happened during World War II and to the Japanese. So this is really one of the most important things that I'm really working hard to educate everybody as to what happened. And more importantly, that we cannot let this happen again. Thank you. No, that's incredibly important. And uh, we, we thank you for all of your work to, to go out in the community and help educate um, the young people of today so that it doesn't get repeated. Um, ben, let's, let's talk a little bit about your family being a no-no family. And, and how did that experience affect you? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the no-no, as you mentioned, were the question number 27 and 28 but uh, my brother was about 22 at age and he had gone through high school already um, before we went into the camps and so he knew about the unconstitutionality of being put into camp and so on so when the questionnaire or loyalty questionnaire came out he went around to the mess halls because you know there, there were a lot of questions about how to answer these two loyalty questions and so my brother worked very hard in the missiles as um, um, people to say, uh, you should answer these questions, no, no, as a form of protest. And in fact, I have an FBI report because, uh, because of his activities in the missiles, he was um, um, loaned by the FBI as the Harakiri kid, meaning the, he evidently was saying things like, if you answer this, yes, yes, I will commit harakiri, which means to slit your stomach. But um, um, I, I have a feeling that was why he got the reputation of being called the harakiri kid uh, by the FBI. But the FBI report that I have, I found out many years later, was uh, shows that uh, he did not want to be repatriated to Japan. Uh, he was... Um, um, doing it as a form of protest. And so I have that written down uh, on the FBI report. And actually, the FBI doesn't lie about things like this. And uh, so I have that as proof that uh, he was um, 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 not doing it for, for the sake of just doing it, but to sh show that uh, this was a, a way to um, protest uh, what we were going through being put into camps and so on, which were unconstitutional. And um, so as a result, uh, we were sent in September of 1943, there in the summertime, uh, we were uh, sent to um, Tule Lake. And uh, there, there are so many rumors about what was gonna happen to us and to, from Tule Lake. And the most uh, important rumor was that we would eventually be sent back to sent to Japan, not back to, but sent to Japan as a, uh, an exchange for the U.S. Army uh, prisoners of war that they had captured during the Korean War and so on. And so um, um, they, they um, um, 
So we would, we told, because there were rumors that we would be sent as an exchange of prisoners of war that the U.S. had. So um, we, many of the people had to uh, go into the Japanese language classes. And I was one, my brother, oldest brother was one of the teachers there. And he was one to start the um, Japanese language classes. And uh, he forced our whole family to go to the Japanese language classes and set up going to the English classes, which opened several months later after this, uh, too late settled. So I have a, a resent, very resentful of my oldest brother for forcing us to uh, just go to the Japanese language schools uh, during the uh, time that we were in, in uh, Tula Lake. But uh, uh, later on, I realized that uh, this was a benefit for me because uh, after the war ended, um, uh, I um, uh, joined the, uh, went in the, went to high school and graduated from high school and the Korean War started. So I enlisted in the U.S. Army. And until then, I didn't speak. I didn't say that I spoke Japanese uh, because uh, I thought uh, that would be disloyal. But then um, when the, um, during the military, this uh, uh, I mean, basic, basic training and so on, they only assigned me to kitchen help work and so on. So I said, no, oh, this is not what I wanted. So. I finally admitted that I spoke Japanese and so took the army language school uh, uh, test uh, that they had in Monterey. And because of the intensive uh, Japanese that I learned in Tudor Lake, I uh, was able to pass the examination and got uh, assigned to the army language school for in Monterey for one year. And then after that, uh, got assigned to the military intelligence unit and was sent to Japan and uh, interrogated the repatriates from China and uh, uh, the Kuril Islands and uh, Hokkaido area, and also went to Korea and, and interrogated the prisoners of war or the Korean War um, in um, Chinese and, and, and Korean. I didn't speak those languages, so we, had, we used the Japanese speaking interpreter and uh, I would uh, ask the question in Japanese and he would uh, ask that same question in Chinese and Korean and give it back to me in Japanese and I would write it down in English. So for a long time I felt, oh boy, I hope I got it right. But I guess I did get it right because uh, nothing has, ha has happened. So that was the, that's when I, uh, my brother, after the war ended, he went back to Japan because of the, mistreatments that he felt uh, he got in, uh, in camp. So, uh, uh, and he, because he was bilingual, he felt that he could help out uh, Japan recover from all the bombings and so on, especially the two atomic bombs that were dropped in Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. So uh, he was back there and I, uh, it was my military, I was back there in Tokyo. And so on weekends, I would go back to uh, to stay with him uh, in his uh, uh, apartment. And that's when I learned a lot of things about what happened in Tudor Lake and so on. And, uh, and he explained a lot of things. So he, uh, I was, as I said, mad at him for forcing us to go to Japanese language school. But uh, as a result of that, I was able to yeah, you get into the uh, Army language school and also uh, to um, go to Japan and so on. So uh, I, I really realized that uh, there was a benefit for uh, learning Japanese, the Japanese language uh, in, uh, in um, the army. Uh, because uh, even after I uh, got discharged from the army, after three years, I volunteered for uh, helping with the sister city programs and speaking Japanese and helping with the senior center uh, people who, who are the East says uh, the first generation Japanese speaking settings starting uh, senior uh, uh, centers and so on or using my Japanese that I learned in uh, too late so I, I, I later on realized that uh, learning Japanese in too late was a benefit 
the line of life that came later on. Yeah, you have a very interesting family story um, and your experience in the camps is different than a lot of other former internees. Um, just want to thank both of you, Ben and Steve, for sharing your stories with us. I think it's really important that, you know, most of the, the surviving internees at this point um, are, are getting up there and they were children in the camps and are getting up there in age. And it's really important that we hear from you and we hear directly from you and get your stories recorded um, because it's an important part of American history that we shouldn't forget. And with that, I wanna to transition to our third segment of, of the presentation, um, where I'm gonna have a chat with Steve and really focus on why we can't forget this episode and what's being done to make sure the story of Tan Fran is preserved for the future. Um, Steve, as I said before, is the vice president of the Tan Fran Assembly Center Memorial Committee. And the committee is spearheading the effort to create a Tan Fran Memorial in San Bruno to ensure that the story of Tan Faran as a detention center is not forgotten. So uh, Steve, tell us what's planned for the memorial. What will be included? What's this gonna look like? This is a really exciting time for the memorial and we wanna hear about it. Absolutely. And I will share some slides. Okay, well, um, the important thing before I talk is to mention some of the people that we, uh, we met along the way that really made a significant difference to us and to the memorial. I, I break them out into two groups, one key financial donors and the other one are key partners. Our key partners uh, did not necessarily give us any money, but for example, BART, we're right outside the San Bruno BART station and BART, they've been incredibly cooperative to the point where they actually gave us a little piece of property outside their station. And we'll show you a picture of that a little later uh, uh, where this memorial will be placed. The other key partner is the architectural firm of RHAA. They're out of Mill Valley. Uh, they have provided us with all the architectural and engineering services to the point it's probably worth about $100,000 worth of fees. The other, um, uh, people that we need to thank, of course, is our construction company, Block, B-L-A-C-H. Um, they really help keep the cost down so that we can have really a nice memorial. And then uh, to help us with the maintenance, the San Bruno Lions Club and Boy Scout Troop 72 of San Bruno. Uh, thank you so much for uh, what you will be doing to help keep this memorial beautiful. As far as our key financial donors. The first one and the most important is, our, is the uh, National Park Service, the Japanese American Confinement uh, Sites Program. Uh, they were the big initial donors. They gave us over 400, almost $400,000 to get this thing going. The County of San Mateo, thanks to the uh, assistance of uh, Dave Pine, supervisor, uh, they gave me a check for $250,000. Other key uh, donors, the San Bruno Community Foundation, um, writing a check for 150,000. The San Bruno Culture and Arts Commission, 50,000. The um, new owners of the shops at Tan Ferran Alexandria Realty, they gave me a check for $50,000. The Japanese American uh, Community Foundation, another 50,000. So without these and the other, in, uh, donors, they, we would not have been able to do what we have. So let me show you a picture of where the site will be. It's right outside the BART station. And as a matter of fact, I took this picture standing at the uh, entrance to the BART station. That little alcove there, that's where we will have the uh, memorial. We just did a uh, groundbreaking and we'll show you a quick picture of that. But the Final picture, <laughs> okay, um, there was a lot of people there. We didn't expect anywhere near that. There was over a hundred people. Uh, we had um, our key speaker was Congresswoman Jackie Spear, shown on the right, and it was a groundbreaking. And the uh, beautiful looking group on the left, that's our committee, minus one, and that's Ben Takeshita, 
who uh, was not able to join us there. But let's go back to the final design. This is what we hope that's what it's gonna look like. Uh, you can see the uh, horse stall, the very modified horse stall on the back left. Those little black plaques on the right, that's where we will have the names of the 8,000 persons who were imprisoned at Tan Friend Assembly Center. And then right in the front, you see that gold statue. That's just, that's uh, where we are gonna take these two little girls. The picture on the left is of their family, the Mochita family. There are 10 of them. And the two little girls, the uh, older one, uh, Miyuki, and the little one, Hiroko. Miyuki six, Hiroko was three. They were our models. Of course, we didn't bring them down there. We just used their picture. But that's what the um, statue looks like. It is cast. It's in the warehouse at the shops at Tamforan. So we're ready to bring it down. But the thing I wanted to point out on that middle picture of, of Miyuki and Hiroko, see the tags? They didn't have their names on it. It was their family number. And hopefully you can see it on the statues. That's what the um, tags are going to be looking like. So we have been um, working on this for almost 10 years. If you want more information, we will show you the website and the uh, email address. We are still looking for donors to help us get over the top. You saw that statue. We do have miniatures and those are available by looking at the uh, website, tamfrenmemorial.org. And it'll tell you how you will be able to get one of those fabulous little statues. They're called maquettes, nine inches tall, weighing almost eight pounds because it's solid bronze. So we hope that all of you will uh, look us up on our website and uh, check on how you might be able to support us. With that, Leslie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And just, just in closing, so tell us why this memorial is so important and why you've been working so hard. You and the committee have been working so hard for 10 years to make this a reality. Of course, we do want to honor the 8,000 persons who were in prison there. And, and like most Asian cultures, we, we do want to honor our uh, ancestors, our moms, dads, uncles, and aunts. So that's one of the reasons. The other one is, uh, you know, we, we think very highly of the city of San Bruno, and this will be a cultural and historical icon for the city. And of course, the third reason, and as I mentioned before, this is a visible reminder to anybody who sees it. What happened to the Japanese Americans in World War II? Their civil, constitutional, and human rights were taken from them. And we cannot, we cannot let this happen again. Thank you. And, and, and when, when is construction expected to be completed and hopefully some big ribbon cutting event <laughs> happening? Yes, um, we, had the, we had the groundbreaking on uh, February 11th and we hope that the memorial will be completed on around the end of May. So we're hoping that the uh, first week of June we will have a big ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, we, were ask, we will ask all of former Tan Fran uh, internees to be there. Uh, we wanna bring them up onto the memorial. We will have the statue draped and we'll ask all of them to take a corner and help unveil the statue. So end of uh, May, early June, keep a lookout for the announcement. Yeah, we are so excited to see that happen. And, and for those of you who no, this is the 80th anniversary of uh, the signing of Executive Order 9066 and the opening of Tanfran as a detention center. And so this really is momentous in this 80th anniversary year to really be bringing this finally to life. Um, it's such an important event, I think, for not just the internees in San Bruno, but for all of us to, to remember what happened and to make sure um, generations after us still will remember what happened during the war and won't forget and we'll make sure it doesn't happen again. So thank you, Steve, and the entire Memorial Committee for all of your efforts to make this a reality here in San Bruno for all of us to appreciate.
And with that, I will turn it back over to Susan for our closing. Echo those sentiments uh, exactly, Leslie. We're all so excited to see the unveiling of the memorial. I know the city was so pleased to be able to um, add to the funding needs through the Culture and Arts Commission and the Community Foundation mm -hmm. um, on behalf of the library. I'm so pleased that I was able to um, bring you all together and um, we couldn't be more grateful for uh, you sharing your stories with us um, it was an incredible evening. I'm so pleased that we had so many people um, join us from all over the country, not just the peninsula and California, but across the country. It's one of the blessings, I think, of uh, the situation that we're in is that we are able to offer this type of a virtual program um, and, and share these types of memories. And as, 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 as everyone has said, you know, we, and we concur, trying to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Um, so there's been lots of um, nice messages from folks across the, across the country. Um, I'm just gonna answer a couple questions because we've been getting this one a lot. Uh, what's gonna to happen to the memorial when the new development is put in? We're very lucky that it's on BART land. And so that is really kind of separate from um, the mall itself. And so um, for all what it's, it looks like it's just gonna, it's gonna be there and uh, for all to enjoy regardless of what the rest of the site looks, looks like. Um, we're getting another little query. If we could put up the, uh, I'm just gonna say very briefly the, the website ad actually, Leslie, would you let us know the website address again for the memorial? Sure, I'll share it. Share the screen again, very quickly. www.tanforinmemorial.org. All right. Well, thank you so much to Ben and Steve and Leslie. It was a wonderful evening. Um, remember folks, you can go to the stories.sambrunolibrary.org to register for the additional two upcoming programs um, that's coming that are coming up. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna close the evening Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.